So I just introduce your speakers and then I'll hand over to, to them. First, we have we have um, Marco Sanchez, who many of you will know is a director with, with Arab. Um, he's a specialist in long span bridges, deep foundations, and also and complex uh, structures. Um, he he went to the Universidad Politécnica de Madrid, which I think it's always important to acknowledge for the younger members that when people start out in university, they end up out into the world working, and this is they end up uh, working on on projects and with people with people like this. Secondly, secondly, we have we have Lucia. Bianco uh, Martin, who's a senior engineer with Carlos Fernandez Casado, and she's worked in bridge design and structural analysis for the last uh, 14 years. Uh, most relevant projects are cable state and extra dot uh, bridges, and they both have, I believe, experience in in the United States as well as as well as here. So with that, I would, Marcus, I'll hand over to you and and Lucia to take it away, and I look forward to your presentation. If we could just ask everyone to mute your, make sure you mute your uh, microphones and also switch off your cameras and um, so we avoid any interference. There's plenty of time for questions at the end. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to uh, share my screen. Let's see uh, if it works. Yeah, can you all see my Looks like it's just coming. We're on a black screen, screen at the moment. There we go. Got it. Okay. And uh, see, are you going to? Yeah. Uh, hello. You have control of the as well? Yeah, I do so. I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there we go. So hi everyone, um, Lucia and myself. It's been, I mean, we, the two of us have been working together for the last four years, but Lucia probably even longer uh, in this project. And uh, we were going to go through uh, uh, the main design aspects, both uh, during digital design and construction uh, of the project, just to make a summary of, uh, of what we're going to talk about. The presentation is pretty long. Uh, it's around an, over an hour, and as uh, it's been said already, uh, we will be happy to answer uh, questions uh, later on if you haven't bored you to death after 70 something slides that we have uh, that we have here. We're going to talk a bit about the general description of a structure, as in the, the main parameters. Lucia will will uh, do that part. Then I'll uh, have a little introduction in what are the main theoretical principles of extratus bridges, and then Lucia will go back and. Uh, Go through the detail, uh, this, uh, the design evolution from tender and what we uh, change from the tender design to the detail design. And uh, then we will develop, uh, Lucia will continue developing the main principles of the longitudinal design of a bridge and the global uh, design. And uh, I will actually take over for the transversal behavior, some of the special studies that were done and the construction. Okay, so as I said, it's a pretty long presentation. Uh, we, we probably do, I'll say, around uh, an hour or some of the topics in itself. Uh, so we're trying to put together uh, the main, uh, what we think is the most interesting parts of the bridge. And uh, we will answer questions la later on. Lucia, so you can uh, start whenever you want. Okay, thank you, Marcus. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here this evening. So, um, okay. It's not a use the space. Yeah, I'm doing it, but I think it's going to slowly or it is not working. I'll, I'll do it then. OK. OK. OK, so the Barrow Bridge is an extra dose bridge um, with a total length of 887 meters, which are um, distributed in uh, five approach spans and four main spans. The four main spans are supported by three sets of parallel inclined cables um, distributed in a vertical central plane. Uh, the two main spans are 230 meters long. And um, what the, this, the span distribution for the west and east approach spans um, is uh, ranging between 36 and 70 meters. Um, next, please, Marcus. 
Okay, um, the 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 red cross section is a post tension concrete box, uh, uh, which can be divided, let's say, in like um, in a central box, uh, which is eight meters wide, and then two overhands uh, with a variable length. Um, and uh, to support these cantilevers, we have in, uh, external inclined webs, which are made of precast panels. Um, and it is to be highlighted that in this cross section, almost all the dimensions are variable. Um, so we have variable width. Um, can you please go to the next one, Marcos? Okay, thank you. So we have variable width, we have variable depth, uh, the external edges of the cross section range, range um, between two and three meters in these areas. And we have a variable super elevation as well. Um, as we can see in the next um, slide, um, the deck starts at, at the first abutment, abutment one, with a total deck width of 19.9 meters. Then it increases in the main spans up to 21.9 meters. Uh, the reason for this increase is that we have the pylons um, located in the, in the median barrier. So we needed uh, an extra width to locate these pylons uh, in the cross section. And then uh, when we get to the um, uh, eastern approach spans, uh, we get an increase as well due to the uh, to visibility issues in this area. Uh, so we get a maximum deck width of 22.96 meters in the area of Pier 6. Then uh, this total width uh, decreases up to 22.5 and it's kept constant until the second abatement. Um, if you continue, please, Marcos. Uh, we're here. Okay. Um, as we have commented before, we, uh, due to this plan alignment, which is curved in the approach spans and straight in the main spans, we have a variable super elevation. Um, as we can see here, um, in the curved areas of the of the approach spans, we have a five percent of super elevation um, that then goes to a crossfall in the main spans. Uh, it is to be highlighted as well that the depth of the cross section is variable. It, ra it ranges in between 3.5 meters up to 8.5 meters. Lateral pylons um, have a deck depth of 6.5 meters, as can be seen in the next slide. And the main at the main tower location, our deck reaches 8.5 meters. Then when we progress to the eastern spans, we go again to a 3.5 meters de depth, as we can see in the next slides. And That's the one we're going to do, she is now. Oh, Sorry. Sorry. Is anyone asking a question? Okay, so accidentally I, muted, yeah. off you go. Okay. Okay, so in the next slide. Sorry, no, no, no worries. No worries. Uh, the, the following one, Marcus, please. Okay, the pylons um, have been designed in reinforced concrete. Um, as we were saying before, these have been fitted within this, the median barrier. Oh, sorry, the, the central reservation of the ridge. So we have optimized one of their dimensions to 1.5, 1.6 meters, um, with the lateral uh, dimensions of the of the pylons ranging between 3.5 meters up to more than six meters. Um, um, here we can see as well that the central pylon at Pier 4 is 27 meters high above deck level, while the lateral pylons are 16.20 um, meters high above the deck level. As we can see in the next picture, um, uh, these 1.6 meters make um, the, the, the pylons quite slender. And we appreciate here the variable uh, dimension in elevation of the bridge. Um, it is 
to be highlighted as well that the pylons, um, what the, the stay cable system um, is continuous from the canker to the canker. So that the stay cables go through the through the pylons by means of saddles. And uh, in order to install these saddles, uh, the pylons have uh, an auxiliary steel structure embedded. Um, as we can see in the next slide, um, um, durability has been one of the um, 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 objectives of, the, of, the, of this bridge. So, um, um, guaranteeing that um, the, the span life of the bridge is fulfilled. So, the, our cable system is fully protected by means of galvanized strands that are protected with a, with, um, a first layer of a protective filler, then a coating, and then the complete bundle of the stay cables um, are um, inside an extruded, ex extruded HPDE coating duct. Um, the cable spacing is 6.5 meters along the deck, while they are 1.1 meters apart in the towers. Um, uh, it is to be highlighted as well that anti-vandalism pipes have been provided at deck level uh, to protect the stay cables. Inside these pipes, um, we have provided also protection against fire. Um, in the next slide, <clears throat> we can see how these deck anchors are designed in the deck. Um, as we can see here, due to the shallow design of the towers, um, the angle between the deck and the form tube of the cables is very, is very small. So, uh, this implies that the form tube occupies a significant length of each of the deck segments. Um, the connection of the stay cable anchors to the deck is achieved by means of internal steel struts. Um, the one characteristic of this um, system uh, to transmit the load from the cables to the complete deck section is that the bottom corner of the steel struts is always located 3.5 meters apart from the top slab. That implies that when we have constant deck depth of 3.5 meters, this bottom corner is located in the intersection between the bottom slab and the webs. But when we have increasing deck depth, we have these struts um, connecting to the, to the webs at an intermediate height. For that reason, and to provide a stiffness to the deck cross section, um, ribs have been provided at the stay cables locations uh, to the deck section. These are made in concrete, in reinforced concrete as well. Um, in the next slide, we can see how the anchor of the stay cable is achieved um, at the pylons. It is by means of multi-tube saddles um, that are located in the pylons. Um, and by this means, the strands are continuous from the deck anchor to the, to, to the other deck anchor. Next, please. Well, here we can see a detail again of the saddles and then all the tubes. Um, it is to be noted that every strand in each cable go through a single tube. So, um, and that the, the strands are peeled inside the, inside the saddles. Next, please. In terms of substructure, the bridge is supported by eight piers. The piers are concrete columns um, in reinforced concrete. Um, their heights range in between 10 and almost 40 meters. And the shape and geometry is consistent all along the bridge, so as to uh, support a, a consistent design from aesthetical point of view. Um, basically, all of them um, consist of a um, vertical shaft and then a curved profile pier head. Uh, the, the approach spans piers. Well, all the piers are um, in deck section, well, in elevation, they are six meters wide. And laterally, for the approach span, spans, we have two meters wide piers, while 
below the, pi the three pylons, we have 3.4 meters wide piers. <laughs> Next, please, Marcos. Um, the abutments um, are open abutments uh, with cantilever wind walls and have been built in reinforced concrete. At the maximum, these, um, back, uh, these abutments have been designed so as to guarantee that we didn't have um, an embank embankment height more than or higher than 10 meters. So it was a constraint um, that conditioned the design of the abutments. Next, please, Marcos. Uh, foundations, we have two different typologies of foundations. We have spread foundations um, in some cases, and we have piled foundations. All piled foundations are provided with one point meters uh, piles, and the most significant foundation in the bridge is the foundation of Pier 4 that we can see in the next slide, uh, which uh, required 43 piles and it, it's, it's also provided with a pedestal which is 2.8 meters high. Okay, next please Marcos. Well, no, okay. okay, I'm going to just actually now uh, stop for a second and before we go to the development of the design and the analysis, I'm going to mention what's an extraterrestrial bridge. Well, in reality, uh, it's a uh, the different people have different opinions. It's a hybrid between a cable state and a conventional balance cantilever. Probably, to my understanding, one of the first concepts is this one, which, as far as I know, was never built by Jacques Mativat in 1988, where it looks like a cable state bridge, but the principle is actually closer to, uh, and that's where the word extratos comes from, uh, which in French means out of your back, uh, from uh, a, an external post tensioning uh, with uh, an increased lever, lever arm. Before that, even there is a bridge that follows the same principle that can be qualified, and people consider them as stratus bridges with solid fins, uh, which is this one from Christian Men from, from 1980, uh, which to some extent can be with bonded post tensioning considered an, an, an extratus bridge. But the principle uh, is as follows I mean, you can have a, con a conventional box on which you are limited, the lever arm at the supports, which governs your hogging moments, is limited by the depth you have, and then you have a cable state bridge. And uh, in some cases, you can have external post tensioning that is less efficient uh, than, uh, than a conventional uh, post tensioning box. But if you want to increase your lever arm in, uh, at supports, what you can do is basically move the cable outside the top uh, face of the deck. And if you do that many times in many cables, what you end up is with that concept, which is an enhanced lever arm in a, in a uh, external post tensioning, but using actually not external post tension technology, which is similar to conventional post tension technology, but cable state technology. And you end up with a bridge that is a hybrid between a conventional box uh, imbalance cantilever and uh, uh, a, a cable state bridge. That's more or less the principles behind an extratus bridge. What happens when you look at, for example, the uh, equivalent uh, area of the bridge to span is that the extratus bridges that are the blue lines happen to be as a, in between cable state bridges that are more slender and uh, conventional uh, boxes that very rapidly grow to uh, areas per square meter that are actually uh, prohibitive and around 200, 200 and, and something meters. That's why the limit of cable uh, state bridges is much higher than in balance uh, cantilever boxes and the stratus bridges having to be in between, which confirms this principle of there something in between a cable state bridge and a, and a conventional uh, box. Uh, but misolizing the uh, principles, I mean, uh, are very simple. Uh, basically, the, uh, the visually look like a cable state bridge with shallow cables. So the pylons are actually lower. They usually have a slightly deeper de uh, decks, like a span divided by 50, rather than a cable state which is where you can achieve a span divided by 100 or 200. And from the point of view of uh, structural behavior, particularly in the cables, what happens is that uh, the variation and loads in the cables tend to be lower in the order of 50 megapascals for the live load uh, in the frequent combination rather than the conventional cable state bridge, which is 100 to 120, more or less. So, uh, 
in reality, that means that technically, because the stress range is lower, you could actually have for uh, certain combinations, the rare combination, a higher uh, load in your, in your cable. And in fact, what happens is that many codes in the world reflect this already. You have some cores there where the conventional 0.45 or 0.4 in Japan is increased when the live load stress range is lower and you can achieve a higher stress, allowable stresses in your cables. PTI, the American code, plays this slightly different, uh, but the core of uh, the red core you see there is, is pretty similar. Uh, the Eurocode doesn't cover these extractor bridges yet. And in terms of testing, uh, the new FIB, which didn't cover this before, now it covers precisely the same principles. The old conventional testing of 45% goods and 200 megapascal for fatigue, there is no a special Stratos one, which is with a slightly lower stress range and a higher upper limit in, in your test. And similarly for uh, qualifying the tests, it refers to a Stratos now and allows for a, a, a different type of testing. So now the codes are catching up with this type of bridge that before, particularly in, tape, in terms of the allowable cable forces were not uh, necessarily covered uh, in detail in, in the structural codes and testing and, and testing codes. In terms of spans, uh, the longest span in, in the world is in Japan, but it has a steel composite box uh, in the central part of a mid-span and is 270. And in terms of concrete, uh, which was completed while the River Barrow was under construction, is 206. So River Barrow at the moment with 230 is, as far as we know, the longest span with a concrete deck in, 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 Extratos, in a Stratos bridge. And now Lucia is going to go back to uh, describe the uh, value engineering and changes from a specimen design and, and the structural behavior in the global of the bridge. Okay, so um, when we participate in the tender, uh, all tenders have like a starting point and the starting point was a specimen designed provided by the NR NRRA uh, that consisted in nine spans um, summing up 902 meters and with a span arrangement quite similar to the ones that to the one that we finally uh, designed uh, at detail at uh, detail stage. Uh, the tower heights in the specimen design was limited to 15 meters to the side to the side towers and to 25 meters for the main tower. Um, in terms of deck cross section, it is still um, uh, the deck cross section was um, specified as a full concrete uh, post tension box uh, with the shape that we are seeing here. And the stay cable system uh, was defined, uh, divided in three sets of parallel uh, cables uh, with a central pylon as well. Um, so, uh, what we try to do is um, uh, uh, using this specimen design as a starting point and considering all the constraints that uh, were applicable to the design, which um, were basically uh, shown here, the structural typology. So it was clear that it had to be an extra bridge. So the, we couldn't go for any other structural solution. Um, the requirement of providing a navi navigational channel um, so as vessels could enter into Neurosport. Uh, this navigational channel uh, conditioned the, loca the location of the main piers and also the height of the bridge. And uh, then <clears throat> uh, we had to consider uh, this uh, requirement of complying with the tower's height above deck. Um, so in order to optimize where possible, um, we realized that um, more feasible optimization was in the deck cross section. So as we can see in the next slide, um, we try to optimize it from a structural point of view and also from a construction pro point of view. So um, the idea of having a central box with vertical webs is construction and work well transversally and longitudinally. longitudinally. And um, in order to maintain the exterior shape of the uh, deck cross section, which was a requirement as well. Uh, we provided these external inclined webs, but made, um, made as precast elements. So their installation on site was easier. Um, it was easier, but it has to be highlighted as we were saying before, almost all dimensions in this cross section are variable. So 
um, even these precast elements had to be analyzed almost case by case. But in the end, they work well um, as precast elements. And in relation to the other um, items of the bridge, um, we um, increased a little bit uh, the, the tower's height, but always keeping the same proportion in between the central pylon and the lateral pylons. Uh, remember that in the first or specimen design, we have a relation of 25 to 15, and now we achieved a 27 to 16.2, which is exactly the same ratio. Um, we, in order to minimize the deck width, we went for a single um, central plane of stay cables, which resulted in large units up to 127 strands, but allowed us to reduce the, the, the central reserve of the bridge and, and to minimize that dimension to 1.6. And mostly it was it because the, the side spans were slightly modified, but in the end, the, the total length of the bridge was slightly, uh, resulted slightly shorter, but it's not a big difference in between uh, the specimen design and the final design. Next, please, Marcos. Sorry, uh, hold on a sec. Yeah. So, right, no yeah. And now we are going to explain how we, um, during detailed design, um, how we carried out the structural analysis of the bridge. But it has to be um, said that um, we, for, from one side, we analyzed the global behavior of the bridge, longitudinal and trans, and, and then we did. Um, local models to analyze the transversal behavior of the bridge and to study um, critical elements such as uh, the prostration anchor blocks or the stay cable blocks in the deck and also the pylons and the deck diaphragms, abutment wing walls. Um, uh, to develop the longitudinal model, we use a frame model with bars. Uh, and with this model, we apply the Euro, the Euro codes and iris annexes with all the corresponding loads and envelopes. And we use similar models um, to those used for the longitudinal behavior of the bridge during construction, um, so as to control the geometry of the bridge while the direction of the main spans. Um, as you can see in the next slide, um, yeah, one of the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. One of the, um, uh, the 3D models with bars was used, uh, which is the one shown in the, the left hand side of the, of the slide, uh, was a bar model that, we, that was used for SLS and ULS analysis and uh, for the global design. And, um, and also it was used during, during erection of the deck. Uh, to control all the geometry and cable forces. And parallelly, um, within the design team, we had another um, built on purpose for the geometry control model, which was a bar model as well, uh, developed with a different software. Uh, with this, we, we were sure that we were obtaining a consistent results. Um, due, due to the significant span, uh, and, and all the critical stages that we went through all the construction, it was important that we were sure that the geometry we were providing was uh, was correct. So with this, we, we gained and we were completely sure that um, the, the, geometry, the geometrical analysis during construction that we were having was consistent and, and was true. Um, next, please, Marcos. And as it can be seen here, but this is just um, um, a small um, illustration of the uh, local model, uh, local models developed uh, by means of shell, 3D elements, and also hybrid models with with bars and with shells. Um, from the longitudinal perspective, um, one of the most um, the most important characteristics of Estrados bridges, as of Estrados bridges, as Marcos had explained um, before, is the shallow profile of the stay cables and the small angle that they um, form with the deck. Uh, 
this um, as a consequence implies that we have very high strength, uh, stresses, compression stresses in the deck that in this particular case has led Lucía, you want to mute. Sorry, I don't know what has ha, um, Should Just I start? Only, no, only the, the last 30 seconds. Or okay, the last 30 seconds. So um, I was sorry for that. Uh, I was saying that um, the shallow profile of the state cables and their, and their angle with the deck implies that we have high compression stresses in the deck. That implies that or the, in this particular case, at least, it has required the use of high strength concrete in uh, certain areas of the approach of the main spans. And another characteristic of this shallow profile is that um, the stay cables um, work well um, uh, for dead load and, and superimposed dead and superimposed loads, but um, they are not very effective in terms of light load or of light load. Um, as a consequence, uh, we have uh, to to design a strong post tensioning system so as to withstand all the all the stresses uh, that we have in service. And next, please, Marcos. Here we have um, included a comparison in between um, the same layout as for the main spans. Um, with the LM1 traffic loading uh, of the national annex in the Eurocode. And uh, we can see the bending distribution, bending moment distribution, um, as if we had a cantilever um, scheme with an extra dose scheme, which is the black line and a cable state um, bridge. Uh, what can be seen here is that in terms of uh, um, negative uh, negative pending moments hogging. Um, what we have is that the extra dose scheme works more like a cantilever beam than like a stay cable bridge. While for sagging in mid spans, we have like an intermediate beha intermediate behavior in between <coughs> the the cantilever uh, scheme and the stay cable uh, scheme. Um, next, please, Marcos. Another characteristic of um, extra dose bridges is the strange, the, the stresses range um, to which the stay cables or under which the stay cable works. Um, mainly in, in extra dose bridges, this stress range is usually in between 50 to 80 megapascals, and for stay cable bridges. Um, this uh, variation in stresses uh, goes around uh, 200 megapascals. In the particular case of Barrow Bridge, we, as we can see in this graph, almost all state cables, this is for, for the side pylons, are above 100 megapascals or even 80 megapascals. Um, this is a consequence of in spite of having a rather stiff deck, as uh, as it is um, a, a char characteristic of extra dose bridges, for having having uh, uh, 230 meters of spans, um, it's not it it results that the deck is not as stiff as it would have um, been thought in the very beginning. So uh, the behavior of of the stay cables is closer to the stay cable um, scheme rather than to the extra dose scheme. However, yeah, I think you muted yourself again. Sorry. Uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the central span uh, where we have a stiffer deck in the area of the pylon, and then the same deck depth in central in in the mid in mid span. Uh, we see that uh, the the stress range um, for the stay cables is higher than the 50 to 80 um, interval for the typical extra dose scheme. But we see that 
um, we have relatively smaller strange range, stress range um, in in all the state cables, and this is because this um, central pylon with the two spans uh, of 230 meters result uh, a little bit more um, likely of a extra dose scheme rather to a state cable bridge. Okay, and the next one, please. Another characteristic to be um, considered in this bridge is that even if the state cable anchors distribution along the deck is symmetrical um, with respect to the pylons, um, the deck have, um, or has a longitudinal slope. This um, has as a consequence that the vertical and the vertical reaction or component of the state cable forces is not the same either side of the pylon, and that leads to having different compression, uh, well, different compression uh, stress layout in both sides at both sides of the of the pylons. As we can see here, the the, the law, the stress law, is not symmetrical either side, and it's to be highlighted as well that the maximum compression stresses are not located where we have the maximum negative bending moment, but at some point located uh, at a quarter of the length of the span. And this is uh, due to the fact that we have um, a hunch here with the variable depth, and then here we achieve the constant depth, and it had an impact in the stress di distribution of the deck. Uh, next, please, Marcos. Um, as a result as well, um, and as we were uh, discussing before, uh, this lack of symmetry uh, in relation to the pylons led to a lack of sym symmetry in terms of concrete strength or st strength distribution either side of the spans. As we can see here, we don't have what well, blue, the uh, blue represents uh, uh, C1895 concrete, and we can see that the distribution is not symmetrical uh, with respect to the pylons. Next, please, Marcos. And now Marcos is going to explain okay. you how the transversal behavior analysis of the of the deck has been done. Uh, well, as most of you know, the global analysis and in general the models you do are with nodes, but when you look at the nodes, sometimes nodes are very big and you need to distribute a lot of forces. So in reality, the, the component of the cable that has a compression in the deck and a, and a vertical component that basically uh, produces a shear law has to be transferred to the different elements. And in terms of the horizontal component, you have a dispersion that creates a tension for a uh, uh, tie in front of the cables, and the vertical component, the shear, has to be transferred to the webs that are located as, at a significant distance. So that requires a significant analysis in terms of the transfer behavior uh, of these type of bridges. But there is another important factor in Stratos bridges, is that because the cable tends to be very shallow, particularly when it's in the middle like this, you cannot actually cross with the central slab and reinforcement uh, in a significant amount when it's clashing with the duct. And, and particularly if you use long, large sizes, what happens in bridges like River Barrow is that you end up losing out of the six and a half meters of every segment, 45% of it. So three meters are not uh, possible to be crossed by reinforcement because you have precisely uh, the cable crossing. So in this case, that lead, led to a solution on which we use uh, post-tensioning just in the area uh, that was allowed in between in between cables. That basically it, the, con the constraint, uh, the area was so constrained that not only the, tra the transverse post-tensioning that was running uh, from both sides of the web crossing the pylon uh, was to be optimized to the maximum number of cables, but also we need to modify the alignment to make it pass in between every three and a half meters, which was the distance we had uh, in every six and a half meters of uh, the distance between between cables. From an analysis point of view, there is another important and interesting component, which is despite you have the props, uh, because the props are uh, flexible and you, the slab is relatively stiff, stiff, there is a distribution of load between what part of the vertical component is taken by uh, the props and what is taken by the 
by the slab in bending, which is the one you need to basically take with transverse post-tensioning. And that was approximately 50-50 in those cable, in those props that, as Lucia mentioned, were attached to the bottom. But the moment you were entering the variable depth, because they're attached to a higher point and the web is more flexible, they were taken even lower than 50% of the vertical component, which means that that has to be taken in the slab. And that led to a significant amount of analysis. As we said, we had different models to basically ensure that uh, the PT would provide enough compression around the holes in the area that in, in which the slab had to work harder uh, to distribute the forces transversally and longitudinally. Uh, and in addition to uh, the, the global and, and local analysis, there were a set of uh, special studies done in the bridge that I'm going to mention briefly. A very uh, important one was the wind studies, uh, which Unlike in many long span bridges uh, that tend to be focused in wind stability, I mean, a Stratos bridge is relatively stiff, as we were saying, in terms of tech. And although the wind studies cover the uh, drag factors and the wind stability uh, of the bridge itself, well, we're mostly focused in the uh, vehicle stability to comply with the contract requirements of the bridge per, uh, being open for the five year return period. Uh, the wind studies, well, it, like many. Uh, other parts of the project were uh, led by Miguel Ángel Astiz, who's a wind, is a world expert in, in wind and whose leadership in, in general in the project and in particular in wind was extremely important for the success uh, uh, of the project. Another aspect in terms of the uh, detailed studies that were required in the project was shipping impact. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, there are big ships actually <laughs> uh, crossing the river barrel up, up to up to New Ross. And there were certain requirements in terms of actually shipping impact load uh, to be on the uh, Consider particularly in Pier 3 and Pier 4 that are too close to, which led to a set of analysis in terms of uh, nonlinear uh, and energy methods to dissipate the energy of the of the ship as it actually get close to the to the the, the Pier 4 uh, foundation. Also, another part of it, uh, it, it, specialist studies that were carried out in relation to fire and uh, ensuring that for a particular uh, fire event, the bridge wouldn't. Which is considered an extreme event, uh, the bridge wouldn't uh, lead to a progressive collapse, even parts of the bridge might be damaged and require uh, a replacement. And this led to a set of uh, specific uh, specialist studies uh, as well. And now I'm going to cover uh, the last part of our presentation, which is basically uh, the design aspects during construction and, and direction engineering. Uh, in long span bridges, uh, how you build a bridge is nearly as important as the design. And in many cases, there are many parameters that are governing uh, your uh, your digital design and they come from the type of construction chosen. In this case, uh, after different iterations uh, with the contractor, Van Dragados, the final uh, decision was to build up to pier three and pier five, the lateral piers uh, with, with the stays using a a scaffold to the ground and for the main core, and then a, a wing traveler uh, for the cantilevers, and to use only uh, uh, traveling for travelers for the, the three cantilevers uh, coming from the lateral piers and symmetrically imbalanced cantilever from, from the central pier. This leads actually to a, a, a one of the first issues, which is that in the lateral spans, if you're going to build them with a scaffold, you either leave the scaffold during the whole construction or at 95 meters, the span to death ratio will require a lot of post tensioning before you install the main cables that you only do when you continue the cantilever. So for that reason, uh, there were two temporary piers located halfway the span, as you can see, that were used to basically take the uh, bending of this span uh, during construction, which leads to other set of problems because obviously having a, a, a central support means that this span is under hogging during uh, construction, but it will be under a small sac uh, under under the live load and in the in the permanent situation in service, which basically complicates the post tensioning uh, for all the stages during uh, the both construction and the permanent situation for for the side spans. In addition, in the central uh, pier due to the span, uh, as you can see, that that's another peculiarity of this bridge because the towers have different heights. The cantilevers will also be different, and basically the cantilever coming from the central pier is 140 meters. Well, the cantilever coming from the lateral piers is actually only 90 out of the 230. This means that in reality, this cantilever of 140 would have equate to an equivalent span of 280 meters, which will be again way on the world record uh, side. So to avoid bending uh, during construction uh, in, in the central tower, governing the whole dimensioning of this tower, uh, 
what we call the push-pull prop, a temporary tower that was able to resist both tension and compression, unlike the, these two uh, temporary towers that only resist compression. This one had to take actually a potential imbalance of loads, was built uh, also in a construction uh, around 30 meters away from, from, from the central pier. This is an example of uh, uh, the west side of the bridge during construction, where you can see the scaffold at the temporary pier, which will be uh, demolished after uh, building this span, which is 95 meters, and the wind uh, traveler coming after. One of, again, a complication of building the cross section in several stages transversely is that you need to comply with full compression later on during service, which leads to post tensioning in several stages, and you might have a significant amount of post tensioning only to achieve compression in your wings later on when you are in service, because the wing traveler is, is basically built against a section that is already post tensioning. From the point of view of the uh, central uh, tower and the balance cantilever, it's uh, the first stages were conventional, and as you can see, the, the, the temporary push pull prop was only uh, reached at around segment five uh, in the construction. An important element to mention in geometry control is the whole sequence of construction and how this actually governed uh, the whole design. Because the shallowness of a cable, uh, you need to adopt a particular strategy in how you actually build the segments. And more or less, each cycle had these elements here. So you, after pouring segment 10 and achieving a certain uh, strength in segment uh, N, you will move the front traveler to segment N plus one. And you will set it out depending on the reflections at that stage, the foreign traveler for in the right position for what, what, what the, the deformation you were expecting in your analysis. And then you will uh, stress the transverse PT of the previous segment uh, in, or, in, I, in, of that, in order to move the foreign traveler and then the transversal PT and the cable in segment N minus one. So the, so the main cable post tensioning was always two segments behind the segment you were working on due to the shallowness uh, of the cable. And in, in principle, all these cycles, which in some cases are overlapped, uh, the, all the different elements of a cycle, you can start placing rebar while you might be stressing the main cable, for example, uh, is to predict the geometry that we were measuring only at a particular stage, usually at the setting out of the foreign traveler uh, here when it's actually in stage three and four. It's very important to mention that now, despite we have two models, it doesn't matter how good your model are in terms of uh, the definition and the analysis you provide, there are certain elements that are uncertain the, 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 in terms of the, uh, the parameters you're adopting. The concrete elastic model, particularly on edges, is unknown, but you might have certain tests. The same thing for creep and its ring-catch curves. The construction times are an estimation. They might vary. The real weights are an estimation as well. They might vary. They're not accurate. They may have, you might have a slightly different weights. The foreign traveler itself, has small deformations that you need to take into account and might have actually, uh, and obviously the survey itself is, is not a precise science and you might have some in terms of actually survey provider certain hours with temperatures and so on. So one of the design measures we took uh, was basically to have two independent models to be sure that if two models were given the same thing and the uh, real survey was given something else, we will need to actually think about what happens. And we had uh, in the models, we use different uh, approaches, one had the, uh, test uh, creep and its ringage curves, so the ones has theoretical values. And obviously, we recalibrated both models as we were getting better information during construction. Uh, and this is an example of what I was saying of the problem of having the cable uh, because of the shallowness of the cable. When you are working in segment N plus one, which is this one, you cannot stress cable N because you will be actually precisely in the middle of the working area. So these guys are stressing. In these features are taken the same day, are stressing actually cable N minus one. So the whole working length was three segments between the main the stressing of the main cable and the transverse PT that you can see in this picture. That this is actually in, in uh, for the future uh, construction stages. And now, as you can imagine, in a project like this, every load has an implication, and we had a, a massive. Uh, set of construction stages with different sequences and different dates, and we produce models that include the load maps that the contractor uh, provide of where is the foreign traveler, with sort of loads that you have in the bridge, and you predict your deflections based on those things. And what many people think, I mean, you can produce, and let's see if this video works, all this construction with hundreds of construction stages where you can predict the deflection of the 
uh, bridge as it goes, and we, you put all the different elements, including the temporary piers, and you, you start looking at deflections with hundreds of stages, and it looks like a, you press a button and you have the solution of how the bridge is going to behave through the whole uh, construction uh, stages. The reality is quite different. Is that Even if when you have this model completely done, this model is based on assumptions of weights and assumptions of your modulus and assumptions of several other parameters as I've described. And the bridge doesn't necessarily behave exactly, particularly concrete bridges the way you, you've mentioned. To start with, for example, you have the real construction times. So we estimated along with the contractor, there will be a slower segments at the beginning, a slightly faster segments, and then they will achieve a constant speed, more or less, could be 10, 15 days, whatever it is, which is kind of the uh, dash uh, red lines. The reality is that for different reasons, different segments take, take different time. And sometimes they go slower, other times they go faster. And that affects obviously the creep and the shrinkage and other things in the bridge. So you need to readapt that all the time. But then other issues we had in the bridge at some point, particularly when they started to achieve a certain speed, is that, uh, and particularly with high strength concrete, as Lucia has mentioned, there is a part in the bridge that has a uh, segment C1895. What we actually start founding, and this is actually the reflections uh, measured before and after stressing a cable, that the two models match pretty well, the two independent models we have, but the real bridge was actually more flexible, but was more flexible only in the part that was young. I was loaded at 36 hours for the long, for the PT of the cantilever. So that's more or less the ages that uh, the previous segments will have or they, are, they had significant loads. And we just found out that, that uh, around segment uh, 16, which is cable uh, 12, more or less. And one of the measures we decided, because the bridge was definitely not behaving as the models were saying, obviously we need to change the models, is was to reduce the time for loading the bridge to, to move it from 36 to 52 hours and, and wait another uh, 24 hours, sorry, uh, another eight, uh, 18 hours just uh, to be sure that the concrete beyond modulus, the uncertainty is not actually the concrete strength, is whether the flexibility of the bridge is the one you're predicting in terms of, of deflections, because we were obtaining larger reflections than we were, than we were expecting. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, one of the most important characteristics of this bridge is the asymmetry. And the asymmetry means that in reality, the cantilevers are not different, are different, are not equal. And the central tower, the cantilever uh, at the maximum stage was 140 meters, while the two side cantilevers were around uh, uh, 90, 90 meters only. So as, as, as I mentioned already, this would equate of a main span of 240 to 40 meters. Okay. This led to, at the time of closing, you can see there, this is actually a very, uh, Funny pictures. This, this, what I draw here is where actually the chamfer of the deck was supposed to be, which is there. Okay. I don't have to tell you that when I took this picture, that the guys, when you arrive to the bridge and they see you there for months and years and they look and see this gap, they start looking and say, what do we get wrong? As in, like, is this, are we going to actually close the gap? And obviously, as I mentioned earlier, this, it's a very significant deflection, but this is what the models at the time were saying, because obviously we were, as I'm saying, we were calibrating the models at the time. So at this stage, our models were extremely accurate in what was going to happen. In reality, at that stage, our model was saying that uh, the deflection of this cantilever was around a meter from the final levels after stressing the, and putting the bridge back in place, while this side, which didn't have the form traveler and other loads, so in reality, we, this was exactly what we were predicting. So we were pretty confident that it was right, even though these guys thought that we're not going to actually close uh, close the gap. And this is for the reason I'm saying earlier on that this cable at, at the time, this is the last segment in the central segment, which is segment 23. We were stressing cable 17. And as you can see, they were starting to stress cable, cable 17 at the time, and that's why the gap is so large. Okay, at closer, when there is no actually a, a front traveler in this side, but it's a front traveler in this side. We were expecting different deflections in both sides. And we designed a specific uh, closure beam precisely to correct this deflection between two cantilevers, which again was the deflection we expected uh, to have at that time. This beam, which you can see here in the final position, uh, after uh, aligning both cantilevers and also uh, closing uh, both sides to, be, to ensure that doesn't, there is no movements during the uh, casting of the last uh, segment. This beam is far deeper than it looks. You can compare it here with a beam. It's a pretty uh, sturdy beam because it has to both correct the cantilever deflection and also ensure that this is uh, 
completely monolithic during the casting of, of the central segment that has around three, three meters. And <clears throat> that led to the completion of the bridge. Uh, that you can see here in a picture. This was actually during the finishes and the construction of the safety barrier and paving and so on. And as probably most of you know, the opening in 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 January of 2020 uh, of the, of the project, which is uh, when they, this picture was taken, just with already uh, traffic uh, uh, on the bridge. So it's been a, a very long journey for many of us, uh, which has taken a a significant amount of effort time for a lot of people. And finally, another important element to, to mention is, uh, like any other modern structure and given the size of the structure, there is a significant amount of uh, sensors and a structural health monitoring installed in the bridge, uh, which is used at the moment by the concessionaire uh, uh, to maintain the bridge. And that provides a lot of information in real time. And I just plotted some stuff. This is today, actually, when I put this. is actually the forces in the cables today. Those. Uh, changes you see there is basically the daily temperature. This is a week, more or less. So in those days, there is actually a significant amount of sun. In the in the early morning, uh, you will see the cable losing slightly a uh, force. The traffic is actually those little things that you will see there. Okay, but this is mostly at the moment, the, the bridge the changing forces in the cables is due to uh, the, the temperature. And similarly, there is actually uh, the temperature readings inside the box. As you can see that depending on whether we actually go to colder weather or hotter weather, you can see the changes uh, changing very little in in days, and there is actually strain gauges in some locations to measure to measure changes in in the flex, in strains and and uh, and elongations of the in the concrete section. And to summarize a bit and a wrap up in conclusions, I mean at 230 meters, this is the longest span in the world with a concrete deck, as far as I know. It's definitely a bridge with its own. Uh, extensive uh, skyline profile, I uh, will say unique in that regard. And to crystallize the original concept, which is probably is far more than noise, like uh, from 12 years old, the bridge was, the project was actually stopped for a significant amount of time for different reasons. But the construction itself uh, was very challenging, uh, particularly the geometric control and required uh, more than four years of uh, a, a huge effort from uh, a, lot of, a lot of people uh, working in, in this project. And before we go to the questions and answers, if you're thinking, I will say what next? After you do something like this, you will say, what will you do after? Well, I will say that coincidentally right now, uh, I'm working with Lucia and a few people in CLC in something that is twice the span, twice the width. It will be world record in, in precast segmental. It's in the States. Uh, so it, it's like we we'll we like to run into complex uh, uh, challenging structures. So. We are not repeating the same thing, We're multiplying everything by, by, it's 40 meters wide with twin segments and delta frames and precast segments. It will be the longest span in, in precast segment in the world at 400 and, and six meters. Uh, and finally, I mean, before we go into questions and answers, I mean, there's a lot of people to thank. From the client to uh, 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 Maud McDonald, last client representative and the PPP co and the contractor. Uh, it required hundreds of people, as I said, uh, working very hard for a long time, but I will say that picture, there was the day of the opening with Miguel Angel and the rest of the team, of the design team, or part of the design team that attended the opening. I'll say, I, as I've spent like many of the people in the picture, four years of my, of my life working in, in that project. And to me, it's been a, a great reward. I know I will be happy along with Lucia to answer uh, any questions. Well, thank you, Marcos and Lucia, for a truly wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I see there's some questions um, coming in, but I just make make a, a couple of comments if I if I may, um, just while uh, people add some um, more questions. I think uh, we we live in a, a highly complex world, and this project in particular is um, a, a seriously complex um, engineering project probably one of the most complex that, that I've, I've seen. And I think the, the, the constellations of, of structural engineering, I like to think of it, is when you see uh, complex systems being broken down uh, into a, a, a clear uh, simplicity. So I'd like to uh, thank you for that. From a, the Institution of Structural Engineers point of view, what, what always attracted me to it, it was the, always the, 
three tenets that we we had it has to be safe has to be functional and it had to be economic but then what we're striving for is to have a simple simplicity of of purpose a unity to it all and and thereby hopefully approach a, a thing of, of beauty and i think you're you've you've uh, you've achieved achieved that so that being said i'm going to take some 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 questions so there's some questions in the chat um I'd say there's lots of um, thanks for a great present presentation. Um, there's a are there independent fender structures for the for the barge and ships in the navigation channel? And what standard do you use for ves vessel collision? Well, to start with, the load was given. I mean, in other cases you can run probabilistic analysis, or but this we were given as a. a, a a lot we need to comply with. I can't remember now if it was 19 mega Newton uh, or something like that. There was a, a, a specific load we need to comply with in terms of the vessel load. So in some cases, you only have uh, information coming from the data in the, in the channel, whatever it is, and you need to do, you can use Ashton has a pretty good one uh, in terms of calculating and do probabilistic analysis in vessel collision and so on. In this case, it was lesser of that type of study because the the load that needs to be taken was given in in the contrary specifications. So in, in that regard, we didn't need to do or do different. I mean, then structurally, the analysis was based in the in the euro codes, like a, like the rest of a bridge. And I can see other questions there asking yeah. for the, if, if departures from standards were applied. And the answer yeah. from a structural point of view, the answer is no. Okay. Okay. Great. And just um, that's Carlos Calado has a, yeah. a number of other questions um, built into that as well. Regarding the construction sequence, the cables were tensioned in a single stage as the balance cantilever was built or in multiple tensioning stages. Uh, Lucia, do you answer that one or me? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, in principle, we designed the state cables um, so as to be stressed once during construction and then to be re-stressed once the deck was complete and continuous. Um, in principle, that was um, what was done on site, but uh, due to um, some um, uh, deadlines and and uh, and other issues on site, what we did is we stressed the cables during during construction when the deck was cantilevering, and then we uh, proceeded with two re-stressings once the deck was closed. Um, and the first of the re-stressings was um, carried out when the super the, the superimposed dead load was uh, being applied, and the other one was a fine tuning of the stage just before opening. Uh, Thank you. In, yeah. In relation to the other questions that Carlos is asking, uh, yeah. Uh, let me see. Uh, the craft with criteria and construction is the same. Well, it's, it's based on the uh, Euro codes and the national annex in, in Ireland. So we need the compression in certain elements and like in, in the transversal behavior of elements that are reinforced concrete, the, the, the crack width that is in table uh, 7 of the 1992 part 2. Uh, you know, and he's asking also uh, the criteria of the cable force is basically to achieve the 0.45 or 0.5, if you include the bending effects in the cables, under a maximum life load. Uh, so basically, every cable is stressed to the maximum load it can take when you discount the life load envelope. So in your permanent situation, you have a maximum possible force in that cable to minimize the amount of internal PT you need. That is a, that is a criteria. Okay, I see. Actually, Carlos has a number of questions. Um, a little bit further down, would you like to address those? Yeah, I, uh, yeah. I, the construction stages has been coordinated between summer and spring. The answer is no. The, the bridge, the construction stages were uh, coordinated to build it as fast as possible, regardless the part of a year. OK, great. Um, I see uh, Darren Noble from the committee in Waterman, um, Moylan. You noted that due to longer, different, differing longitudinal compressive stress in the deck, there were, or there are different concrete strengths along the length of the bridge. Can you describe how the long-term behavior of the bridge was analyzed, taking into account the different concrete strengths, and how does it affect the pore sequencing? Well, <laughs> I, carefully. 
No, it's a very complex analysis and you need to build the model in stages and it's extremely time consuming from an engineering point of view. But yeah, we consider those models building up stresses and, uh, and running long-term effects and deflections in the long-term. So there are models that take uh, an hours to run and that have a, a significant internal complexity to calculate all those effects. There are some questions in relation to yeah. quantities, but unfortunately we cannot answer those uh, yeah. for different reasons. I don't, it's not possible. Um, let me see. It's a question there from Liam about the design life of the bridge. So what's yeah. the design life of the bridge and what will be the ongoing maintenance requirements? It's 120 years. But obviously not all elements are 120 years. Uh, the bridge has bearings in every single support by the central one, which is integral, and their expansion joints, and obviously the cable system. I mean, technically the cable system and other elements might have a warranty of 50 years or 40 years, so but it might they might last longer depending on on different uh, other issues. But the bridge in itself is designed uh, for 120 years. Yeah, but the, as part of the design, we have a wide um, maintenance and operational plan. So it covers uh, all the strategy so as the span life of the bridge can achieve the 120 years, including periodical inspection and maintenance activities of all the elements. We have a. Yeah, I see. yeah Jonathan, make. Mayok, um, what measures were in place to prevent the cables being overstressed during construction or not? Well, uh, the first thing, sorry, Max. The first thing is that it's very difficult to overstress the cables because the, the vast majority of the load is self weight. Concrete bridges are very heavy. So, uh, in reality, other loads, there are very few other loads that can change the load of a cable from the theoretical one. Uh, you stress the cables at 0 0.4, 0 0.3 during construction, and the increase in load due to other stages are predicted in the models, and the uncertainty in that parameter, unlike deflections and others, is very small. So you know very well what is going to be the cable force. Yeah. So it's the proper mo the, the modeling in itself that gives you that uh, certainty that you're not overstressing the cables beyond the what is required in the standards. In addition to that, in the vast majority of the cables, there was a reading cell with the real load. You want to add anything, Lucia? No, I was going to say that we have load cells in almost all the cables and that lift of tests were performed um, as well to double yeah. check. And I can so see that. In, sorry, in certain stages of the design, when we wanted to verify whether the model and the reality were in the same point, uh, we we perform lift of tests as well. And that was within reason quite accurate. So when we we're pretty launching yeah. cables, they weren't too far away from where we were pretty. I see that my friend yeah. Bankar is asking about the construction loads. And I'll say we use the real construction loads, as in the real form traveler loads and the re given by the contractor. And uh, so do, for the final election engineering, we use not only the form traveler, there's many other elements, but we use a, a full set of load maps to break the geometry. Then the safety check is with safety factors, but in it's unfactored and with the real loads or as accurate as possible in construction. Yes, Mar sorry, Marcus, I have uh, questions there. Um, you, you, which which code did you uh, consider uh, for the construction load? Is the ASTO code or is there some no. we apart from apart from form traveler load? We have to have some. Construction live load, uh, wind, and other loads, temperature. Eurocode. Eurocode. Eurocode is that. Yes. I see that um, we've got, excuse me if I get this name wrong, Wen Tsing, who's got um, his or her name up. I don't know whether you've got a question and want to come in. Uh, is there so many questions I'm missing? In them? Uh, which one? I, it's hand. just someone with their hand up. Oh no, it's gone back down. Okay, we go back to the chat. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a couple of uh, good questions here. With the does the service data from from Joe Bryan does the first service data from the first year reflect the expected structural response predicted by the various models? And if there was a discrepancy, can you elaborate on that? I'll say so. 
I mean, there's nothing in the current readings we are uh, show, seeing in the bridge that it shows anything abnormal. If anything, I will say the following, and I actually mentioned it briefly, uh, is that compared to the live load that the Euro code and other codes uh, uh, basically uh, allow, you, like uh, request you to consider, the, the bridge, and this could be COVID related or in general, because obviously New Ross is not the port of Rotterdam in terms of traffic. The live load produces a tiny change in the cable forces. So you need to basically zoom in and you see changes that are of like, I don't know, but probably 0.1 or 0 0.01 Newton per square millimeter rather than the 200 we saw there, which is for a, a very unusual load case of all trucks queuing back to back and loading one span, which is what it code tells you. So in reality, if I were was going to remark anything of the way the bridge behaves, is that it, there is basically no traffic load in the bridge compared to what the bridge is able to take, which is in the long run, very good news for the cables because they're very far from their fatigue cycle and they're taking very little oscillations in, in stresses, you know. The, the, all those waves you were seeing were basically temperature, not actually tracks crossing the trucks crossing the bridge you know okay great um just this good question from um william o'sullivan and how do you deal with differential settlement between the piled and ground bearing foundations do you um well these um, we had like a design uh, a complete geotechnical assessment of all the foundations was done and we introduced differential settlement as part of our design actions in the bridge. So we take account of those. And during construction, then um, we monitor uh, like um, long term settlements and short term settlements. And, and we can see whether we are where we should be in terms of actual settlement. Good. Can I add, add to that myself? Or did the, your Structural superstructure analytical model include uh, soil stru structure interaction model, or was it separately separate models to do with the effects? What, um, for, for pier four, uh, we did it ourselves, and for the remaining foundations, we had a geotechnical specialist providing um, uh, the, the maximum allowable, allowable uh, stresses in the in in the at the depth that we were uh, putting our foundations okay great i see one good question from john uh, glenn but uh, can i make a remark on that yeah. which is in general long span breaches differential settlement is not very important because the span and the flexibility of the deck and in addition particularly in pier 4 obviously it's it's uh, piled into rock but the vast majority of the load will, will be whatever settlement you have. It happens before you close it when it's a cantilever. Okay, and you are correcting that as you go. So in reality, it has very little effect. And then obviously differential settlement in a span of 90 or 100 meters produce very little forces. But it was actually designed with separate models in general. Um. The wind, there's a couple of questions about wind. Yeah, One. and the wind barriers, there's a question on the... Yeah. There are wind breakers to protect vehicles from Elizabeth Lawless. Well, there are wind breakers around the pylons because of the, the pylons themselves produce a turbulence as a tower, and mm. they produce basically an effect that destabilizes uh, uh, vehicles uh, crossing. And in this, or even in, in Waterford, which is very close in the Sword Bridge, you will see that there is this wind breaker at the pylon location. But in the in both edges, the criteria was the requirement to demonstrate whether for the five year return maximum wind, the vehicles are stable in the bridge, which is a criteria like any other. You can have a criteria that provide that for a hundred year return period, which will be a much higher wind and you might need windshields for that. So obviously there is a point where the wind speed is so high that you might need to close the bridge because the winds are very high, which happens in nearly every bridge in the world. It's, a, it's an equilibrium between if you want a bridge that is wider because you have wind shields, that you might close one every 20 years, but you've made it just for that scenario, or you have a bridge that is narrower and more economic, but you might close one every five years in the storm, whatever it is called. So it's that balance and the contract required 
precisely study that, which is what I mentioned. There was a specific study in that uh, in that field, ensuring that for the requirement of a contract, which is that for the five year return period, the bridge can remain open because it's safe for vehicles. It doesn't mean that we might have next month storm, whatever that provides mm -hmm. a wind that is 40% higher than the storm in the one in five year return period. And then you need you might need to close the bridge in one night or whatever other event. So it is a criteria that is very technical. In reality, you cannot design a bridge to close it, not to be closed by any wind, because obviously there are storms on which the not not the bridges, but any an embankment can be uh, dangerous for vehicles to to drive on. Um. From Damien Damien O'Brien, it was mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that there were measures in place on the bridge to protect the cables from fire damage. Could you explain what these measures are? And thanks for okay. a great presentation. Yeah, it was a special studies I've gone through. Uh, very, there's only one slide about that. So basically, if there is a fire event in the bridge, which is very unlikely, but if there is a fire event in the bridge, uh, the, the, the cables are protected in the lower part, so it will give enough time for the fire brigade to arrive to the bridge with a limiting damage in the cables in such a way that the bridge doesn't collapse. That's basically what it is. So within the lower part of the bridge, there is a blanket, a fire blanket that will protect the cables during a, a, a short period of time. Okay, um, just one on on um on car on carbon in your opinion does an extratus um the help to reduce carbon in long spans in the material use no 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 yeah i i that's a kind of a tricky question in my opinion i mean storage switches are not necessarily the most material efficient ones but it's a, it's a far more complex question than that. Obviously, this bridge with very high towers will be completely out of place, given the landscape around. So there is a certain balance between achieving a particular iconic profile and providing a, a structurally efficient uh, solution. Uh, and for, in my opinion, in general, the Stratos bridges are not the most efficient, but they provide a certain aesthetic uh, benefit that other type of structures don't provide either because they're too chunky in concrete with no cables or too high towers. So it's a, it's a, it's a fine balance, but it comes at that not necessarily being the most efficient uh, type of a structure. And probably that link with John Glynn is asking. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so as well. I was going to switch to that. And uh, do you do you push the extratus technology further in terms of span? Well, you've already um, answered that in the in the US. But what do you, what are the current limiting factors? Well, the US one is not is not extratus; it's conventional cable estate. I'll okay. say in extratus, the limiting factor is the weight and the cable efficiency. Uh, so I'll say someone will do a three hundred meter cable estate extratus bridge at some point, probably with a steel composite back rather than full concrete. That's what I will say. Okay, and uh, I, I think one last one last question. There's lots of thanks um, coming in, but from Martin Borzak, uh, thank you for an interesting presentation and project. Would there be any benefit to opting for a precast segmental construction of the deck if it was possible in Ireland? Lucia, do you want to answer yeah, that? Well, yeah, um, if it were possible, it uh, and the deck uh, cross section. Uh, could have been like more constant, it could have been feasible, but considering all the variable um, uh, items or elements in, within the cross section that we had, um, it would have implied pre uh, prefabricating every single segment. Um, so it, it could have been not probably very effective. Okay, with that, I'm just going to uh, take one, add one comment from the, the chat. It's from Daniel and Hearn. I think it's a nice way to, to finish off before I ask one of our committee members to give a vote of thanks. It's from Daniel Ahern. It says, thank you for a wonderfully, wonderful, informative presentation. It is a beautiful design. And as a local from New Ross, it was a pleasure to watch its construction progress. And I've enjoyed crossing the Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy Bridge over the River Barrow since it opened. Congratulations to all involved in its design and construction. 
I think that's a very nice way uh, to finish. To, before I uh, I pass over to, we have Kieran Hanley from from the committee, who's who's a bridge engineer with with um, Maliki Walsh and Partners in in Cork, and also an adjunct le lecturer of civil engineering in in uh, UCC. So I'd ask Kieran to uh, give a, a vote of, of thanks on behalf of the regional group. Thanks, Paul, and, and thanks, Marcus and Lucia, for an uh, excellent presentation. I don't think Paul was selling a short at the start when he said that this is an iconic bridge, and it, it truly is. Its, it's effect on the landscape is, is, is stunning. Uh, having been there myself in person, it, it just, the, the scale of it all, when you, when you get there, it just blows you away. And I think it, when you couple that with the fact that, you know, we have a, a record-breaking span for structural engineers in Ireland, there is a certain degree of pride with having it, uh, having it here, uh, even if it is just in Wexford, right? Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the, I, I was going through the, uh, following through the presentation, I was trying to add up the, um, the level of constraints that were involved in the project. And it, it was, it, you know, for me as a, as, a, as a viewer, it was becoming too much. And I can only imagine what it would have been like for the designers to, to try and uh, tally all that together. What I did find uh, to be a, an interesting uh, aspect of the constraint was, or even just in terms of working with the landscape, is that uh, longitudinal slope. And while it did, as you say, introduce this kind of level of uh, asymmetry within the, the deck design, uh, I do think that it actually kind of lends this, despite the design headache that that lack of symmetry will give, it does kind of lend itself to this great fourth perspective of the bridge, which means that it photographs very well, uh, even just on the ones you have there now on screen. It does seem to kind of almost stand out when you do see it photographed against different bridges around the world. Um, the level of precision that was required um, in, in doing the analysis and in doing checking the design, the construction engineering, I found it funny, like you kind of almost at one point skimmed over the fact that there was a, a one meter gap uh, in the segments when you were joining up together. And I can only imagine that that contributed to one of your sleepless nights uh, that you were talking about. Um, but the, the level of engineering that's uh, required to try and remedy that on site uh, is phenomenal. The, the, I, I found particularly interesting towards the end when you mentioned about the uh, structural health monitoring system in the bridge. When I think about structural health monitoring for the most part, it's the, the old bridges, kind of old railway bridges, uh, existing bridges. I find there's something quite uh, voyeuristic about being able to structurally health monitor your own bridge and being able to log in and check how it's doing on a, on a day to day basis. So I imagine that provides uh, quite some interesting reading from time to time and, and even being able to monitor that kind of structure long term, I think it gives great research opportunities and is going to give us real insight into how these bridges behave. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, wrap up there by saying just look, obviously, uh, just such great comments and a lot of complimentary words being given so far. But a project like this obviously requires, I think, engineers working on the very top of their game. And so to you, Lucia and Marcus and the rest of the team, I just want to congratulate you all on a, on a very successful project. And I wish you the best of luck. And I think it was the Corpus Christi Bridge, if I, if I recognize it, uh, in the US. And I look forward to reading and hearing about that bridge in the future. So thank you very much. Thanks thank to you. Thank you thank very much. It's been my pleasure, too. Yeah. Thank you, Kieran. And I, I think if we were in, um, it's, I always think it's a shame that we're not in person, because I know at this stage there'll be a big cheer going up in, in, the, in, in the lecture theater. And I'd ask people that maybe in, in, in absence of that, that we could all uh, raise our hands by, by, by show of hands that you see that the, there's a wide range of appreciation that, that, we, we, that, that people have a, a experienced um, tonight. So with that, there only remains for me to um, say, um, uh, but well, before I, I actually sign off, there's just two announcements. One is that um, our annual dinner, unfortunately, the regional group's annual dinner was held uh, this time last year in, in February. And now, unfortunately, that's been cancelled. So um, uh, um, we'll have to uh, postpone that until uh, events in, improve. And um, but with that, I certainly will be once things open up, I will certainly be going down to um, outside my five kilometers to visit um, this bridge and drive across it and actually probably park where that photograph is taken and maybe spend some time just looking at it because it's a it's a beautiful 
it's a beautiful thing. Um, there only remains for me to say then that uh, our next meeting is on the 16th of February. In, it's been held in conjunction with Engineers Ireland in Cork and it's another bridge and it's Daly's Bridge refer, uh, Refurbishment which is a, also known locally known as the Shaky Bridge. So that also promises to be a, a, at a quite a different scale and, and age and technology but also I think it's going to be a wonderful um, a bridge to experience. So with that, a thanks to Victoria uh, Jensen, who's managed all our IT, who's, who's, uh, who's turned out it's, a, it's a, a, a definitely a, a special skill she has in making everything run smoothly. Kieran Hanley, um, for his vote of thanks and all the rest of, of the regional group committee, thanks for all your support, and especially to Marcus and, and Lucia for a truly wonderful um, and excellent presentation, which I think um, people will be will be reviewing again right into into the future quite a quite a number of times so thanks thanks again for your for sharing your 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 knowledge and and clear expertise